I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. I'm going to take a look at 14.8 nationalism in Eastern Europe, as well as the spread into Russia. All right, so some of the things we'll be taking a look at as we move into this new lesson, we'll be looking at how nationalism changed Austria and the Ottoman Empire. We'll look at the major obstacles to progress in Russia. We'll describe the cycles of absolutism, reform, and the reaction that followed by the czars. We'll also look at how industrialization contributed to the outbreak of revolutions in 1905. Now you'll see the word czar at different points in time, sometimes with the TSAR or the CZAR. I kind of like the CZAR myself, so just keep that in mind. It's synonymous. It also means the same thing. Question one, as we look into some of the old empires, who controlled the Holy Roman or Austrian Empire for over 400 years? What was the Austrian Habsburg dynasty? And anytime you see a last name and dynasty associated with it, it means that that monarchy dominated for a long period of time. So that family was the one that dominated the Austrian Empire for a long period of time. Two, number two, how did the Habsburgs rule in the years of the Congress of Vienna. They upheld conservative goals and they kind of fought back and pushed against liberal forces during that period of time. They adopted the old philosophy, rule and change nothing. Three, what did the government do to slow down and prevent changes? Well, one of the things they did is they resisted industrialization and new ideas. They kind of felt like these type of things uh, threatened the tradition within society. They imposed strict censorship, which restricted the freedom of press. Now, despite this, as we look into number four, despite the desire to prevent change, what was occurring by the middle 1840s? Well, what they did is they couldn't hold back permanently some of the changes that were occurring throughout the rest of Europe. The ideas of the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment ideas are beginning to spread and take hold in different areas of the Austrian Empire. We saw eventually rapid industrialization and urbanization begin to take hold in some of these cities throughout the empire. There was a lot of discontent amongst many of the workers. And since this is the period of time when Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto came out in the later 1840s, we then saw some of the early socialist or communist ideas begin to spread. And then there was nationalistic feelings that were taking hold in different parts of the Austrian Empire. The Austrian Empire controlled many different ethnic groups within the Habsburg dynasty. And we have a little map here that really helps you to visualize and kind of capture the different ethnic groups within the Habsburg dynasty. It was a pretty large empire even in today's standard, to have 50 million people living in your empire, 25% of which were German-speaking Austrians, about 50% of which were different Slavic groups, whether they are Czechoslovakians, Slovak, Poles, Ukrainians, Romanians, Serbs. Also, you had the Hungarians and some Italians who were kind of grouped up in, within this empire. And you can see the color-coded uh, different groups there that are lined up there in the key. Germans and Hungarians, the Czechs, Slovakians, Poles, Ukrainians, etc. You also see the Habsburg crest there. The family crest is kind of like symbolic of the Habsburg dynasty. When you think about some of the problems that are going to be associated with having such a diverse group living in one empire, well, they all had different beliefs and nationalistic goals and religions, and it's kind of difficult to keep everybody happy when you have so many different groups within the empire. Seven, what happened when nationalistic rebellions broke out throughout the empire in 1848? The empire crushed them. They crushed any of these rebellions. And was the empire taking on a very tiny uh, nationalistic outbreak, they're going to have the uh, advantage in terms of military. Eight, who inherited the Habsburg Empire in 1848? You know him. You love him. Francis Joseph. He's going to have quite the reign as the leader of the Habsburg family and dynasty. You have two pictures there of him. One of a very young Francis Joseph, just a little bit older than everyone 
in our class, 18 years old. He'd be basically a senior in high school right now. So you can see the painting there of the young Francis Joseph. And then you can see Francis jo Joseph towards the end of his reign in the early 1900s there with all the different medals he had earned as emperor. He remained in power through the middle of World War I in 1916. So quite the run of just uh, under 70 years in that position. Like most, he had ups and downs as the leader of the Austrian Empire. What happened after Austria lost a war with France and Sardinia in 1859, some of the groups within the empire began demanding self-rule, including one group who was really hungry for independence, and that was the Hungarians. They wanted to be independent and free from Austrian control. So at this point in time, Francis Joseph was forced into a dilemma or a big decision to make. Could he resist the Hungarians' movement? The Hungarians were, of course, one of the more powerful groups within the empire, and Hungarians in general were powerful people. So Francis Joseph granted a new constitution that established a legislature. However, the legislature was dominated by German-speaking Austrians, which did not really appease the non-German-speaking groups within the empire. Eleven, because their military was weakened, Austria in 1866 decided they would give in to some of the Hungarian demands, and they established a dual monarchy, and this became the new Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Why was the dual monarchy an insufficient compromise? Well, Hungarians were satisfied, but other groups of people within the monarchy resented the idea that all of a sudden the Hungarians had more of a voice and say within the government. Uh, this created a lot of restlessness amongst especially the Slavic groups during that period of time. The Slavic groups wanted more autonomy, more control, and by the early 1900s, nationalist unrest often left the government paralyzed in the face of pressing political and social problems within the empire. So by 1900, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was struggling. Next, we'll move on and take a look at the Ottoman Empire. Maybe look at the Ottoman Empire here on the map. You could see that the Ottoman Empire extended into Northern Africa, across the Red Sea and into the Middle East. And the home base of the Ottoman Empire, and they're often referenced as the Ottoman Turks or Muslim Turks, was based in Turkey and uh, southeastern Europe. So there were Muslim Turks that controlled a multinational empire from Eastern Europe to, through the Balkans into North Africa and the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire had a nickname, the Sick Man of Europe. This is because nationalistic revolts by some of their subjects within their empire had weakened the Ottoman Empire and made it vulnerable, like it was sick or injured. And European powers began to exploit this as they began to pick away and kind of take off different points of their territory. By the early 1900s, because of a lot of the nationalist uprisings, in particular in southeastern Europe, part of the Ottoman Empire, what did many people begin to refer to the Balkan region of Europe as? And there it is. You see the imagery. imagery. It was the Balkan powder keg. And if you know what gunpowder basically is in a big keg like that, you just need a spark to kind of set it off. And that was basically uh, southeastern Europe during this period of time along the Balkan Peninsula that uh, was in a region that was definitely ready for revolt or revolution. Later on in history, we'll see how this is kind of the spot where World War I is going to break out. Now we're in a kind of a hurry as we go into the next section. We're going to go into Russia. Let's see the Russian Empire. Actually, we see all the empires kind of illustrated on this map. This is really a quite a brilliant map here. You have the Russian Empire, you see the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you see the German Empire. And of course, we know where the Ottoman Empire is located there, just south of much of what we see on the map. All 
right, so let's take a look at question 16. Describe the extent of the Russian Empire in the 1800s. The Russian Empire stretched from Eastern Europe to the Pacific. It had lands along the Balt Baltic and Black Seas. It expanded into the Caucasus region, into Central Asia, and it acquired a very vast multinational empire over parts of Europe and Asia. 17, describe the different levels in Russian society and the interac interactions they had with one another. There was the landowning class of nobility, a small, weak middle class, a large serf or peasant po population bound to the land and to the landowners who controlled them. The czar and his nobles dominated society. Nobles took factory wages from peasants, resisted change of any kind. The peasants were forced to work the land or serve in the army. Tsars had absolute power and feared that losing the support of the nobility if they initiated too many reforms. So in some ways, if you remember back to King Louis XVI in France, he was afraid to make too many reforms for fear that he might upset the nobility. And the czars weren't all that different here in Russia. 18, in addition to working the land, what were some of the other tasks that serfs had to do in Russia? Well, most were peasants. Some were forced into the military and served as soldiers. Others were servants or artisans. As Russia built factories, some were forced to work in factories, but masters would then take most of their pay. Nineteen had a Russian czar's rule throughout most of the centuries. They ruled with absolute power. Twenty. What is a dynasty? I'm sure you've heard this term before. It's a long period of dominance. Most often we reference this to monarchies in power in a particular country. The family that dominated Russia for over 300 years from 1613 to 1917 was the Romanov dynasty. The very first czar, what a great name, Michael in 1613. And the very last of the czars was Nicholas II in 1917. Other dynasties you might hear about take place, let's say in professional sports. Let's say you win uh, a world championship, you know, three or four times in a short period of time, you're considered a, maybe a dynasty in your particular sport. 21, what were the three pillars of czarist absolutism? Orthodoxy, this is the strong tie or bond between the government and the Orthodox Church. The autocracy or absolute power of the state, and Russian nationalism, which was the preservation of traditional Russian culture and the suppression of non-Russian groups. 22. Moving on to 22, in reaction to the loss in the Crimean War, what did Tsar Alexander II do? First of all, you look at the map here, the base of the Crimean War is taking place based in this region here of Crimea which is a region within the Russian Empire. And you can see the fighting takes place with the different movements of the ships here in the Black Sea. Point two, in reaction to the loss, the Tsar felt some pressure to kind of calm the masses, so he freed the serfs. So Tsar Alexander II took the nickname Tsar Liberator or Emancipator. Number three, what was the impact of the emancipation of the serfs? Well, serfs, they really struggled because they lacked the skills to pay the bills and money to do well in Russian society. And you can't be tied to the land and basically be a slave for such a long period of time, not be very well educated, not have many skills besides to work in the land, and just basically tossed out into regular society. Okay, 24. What did Alexander II establish to give local people a say in the government? Uh, the Zemsaws, which were local forms of government responsible for matters such as road repair, school, infrastructure, infrastructure, agriculture, things like that. 
Other reforms as we look at 25 passed by Alexander II include trial by jury, the easing of censorship, and rebuilding up of the military. So overall, he was a relatively successful czar, despite the uh, loss in the Crimean War. Twenty-six Alexander the Second's reign is often uh, re referenced as the representation, the pattern of reforms and repression used by his father and grandfather Alexander I and Nicholas I. Is this true? Cite evidence. Well, he, Alexander the Second emancipated the serfs, set up a system of local government, made legal reforms, and encouraged industrial development. When these reforms failed to satisfy much of the population, discontent grew and his leadership and rule become more repressive. And he became more of a dictator in the aftermath of some of the unsuccesses. 27, what was Russification? Did this increase nationalism? Russification was a program that was implemented to suppress non-Russian cultures, establish just one language and religion, the Russian Orthodox Church, and kind of emphasize anything that was Russian. This led to the persecution, on the other hand, of other groups such as Poles, Ukrainians, Finns, Armenians, Muslims, and Jews. So if, you, if you're all in on one religion, one group, one language, one culture, then if you have a diverse empire, everybody else is on the outs. You kind of follow that. 28, and this is just your opinion. I gave two different thoughts on it here for us. Do you believe the United States of America should force citizens to learn English and accept American traditions? No, everyone should have the freedom to choose their own way of life. You could argue yes, because it's important for everyone maybe to assimilate to American culture and understand American traditions. Twenty-nine, why did railroads help nations such as Russia to industrialize and grow economically? Well, railroads would connect together faraway places within an empire or country, allowing raw materials to get into factories, manufacture products to consumers, and consumers to travel within the country itself. The more you can move people, goods, and supplies around, the more expansive and strong your economy can be. In many ways, transportation is kind of the root foundation of a strong economy, especially during the 1800s. 30, what action did the Tsar take against Jews? Just like we had seen in France, and we saw, we're going to see horrifically so, even more so in Germany, anti-Semitism was prevalent throughout all of Europe, much around the globe at this point in time in history. So it severely, anti-Semitic laws in Russia by the Tsar severely limited the number of Jews who could attend universities, practice law and medicine. They restricted where Jews could live. They launched pogroms, which were organized campaigns of violence against Jewish communities. Jewish homes and synagogues were burned, looted, and many Jews fled the Russian Empire. Lesson reflection, what factors sparked nationalistic uprisings during the 1800s? So collectively, when you look at all the different empires we've discussed today, the desire to live together with people who share a common culture, the unfair treatment by the government, and the desire to embrace new ideas, new technologies, and a new way of life, all help to spark nationalistic uprisings. I hope you enjoyed our discussion for today. Until next time, Mr. Clark is out.